we're really happy that Alex could join us for the school, really with, this, with the whole idea, okay, we have a bit of an understanding of our brains, different species, we have this wish to find, let's say, common principles in the design of these brains, um, but what can these brains really do out there in the wild? And we thought Alex was exactly the right speaker for us to, to bring, a, bring that to our attention, a bit particular um, emphasis on the cognitive abilities of birds. So Alex, it's great that you're here. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, yes, really, with respect to um, the, the previous talk, for example, several of the other talks, is um, you, you have to prepare for a qualitative leap. Um, things are going to be uh, very different here, and not because I wish. I admire that very much, but we, we are condemned if you work on what animals actually do in the world, to observe behaviors at the level of complexity and our uncertainty as to what they are doing and why is so great that we are miles away from the level of analytical uh, precision that you have in neuroscience. And the reason for someone like myself to talk in a place like this is that um, it is common in very heavily technologically dominated fields to forget what your question is. I'm not talking about potential practical implications, but if you, um, you know, we've seen it with imaging, we've seen it with other things. I mean, people are seduced by the, the wonders you can do with technology and they forget really what is it that we wanted to know in the first place. And so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that kind of things and mostly based on ignorance about what my own animals do. Um, okay, just to introduce myself, the, the topics in which I have been working for most of my career, but um, uh, even still today with different collaborators, are uh, an intersection of these three different fields. Um, so on one hand, studies of what animals actually do in the wild, and um, on the other hand, some very precise experimentations on, on how the animal as a decision maker operates in very controlled uh, laboratory conditions, and on the other hand, to try to compare the cognitive performance of different groups of animals and to analyze what each one does. And the research uh, topics or the, the research models that um, I am working with at the moment include these three different ones. On one hand, um, I am very excited about um, the last uh, 10 years or so work we've been doing on brood parasitic birds. These are birds, you're probably familiar with the European cuckoo, uh, a bird that doesn't make its own nest, but actually lays eggs in other species and lets them do the work. Um, the trickery that develops on the part of the parasite who has to use has to use the other species through the sense the normal sensory machinery and decision processes evolved in that species for its own good and the parasite has to use it to manipulate it to do what it needs to be done and um, so the parasite has this extraordinary thing and, they, and this drives the, cogni the cognition of the host. And similarly, the host develops defenses which actually regulate what the parasite can get away with, what kind of signals it uses, because here instead of having a harmonic system like our brain, all the cells of our body share the same genome and so they would try to Hey, we are a, a clone, if you want, and, and we try to help our um, gametes to go into the next generation. In this case, it's a conflicting system, and um, for that reason, this is very interesting. This is a parasite, and this is um, one of the many hosts that is feeding this baby, which doesn't look at all like the, um, like the host, and nevertheless, they manage to use precise trickery to make them do what they want. I'm not going to talk about that at all today. The other topic, which has been the main uh, streak in my career, was to use the Starling as a model, and mostly, although not exclusively, in the laboratory, trying to study the Starling as a statistician, as an economist, 
as a mathematician. So how well they understand probabilities, how do they calculate means, for example, just to give an example, we came to the conclusion that for many variables they use geometric means rather than arithmetic means, and that has to do with the way they encode information and decode it, and things of that sort. And so um, there's a lot of work that might have been, is the most evolved area of my research, and might have been very relevant to provide worked out examples for perhaps people in robotics or artificial intelligence to, to get inspiration with. But I'm not going to talk about that either. And the next issue is more complex solving forms of cognition, particularly tool use. And this is exciting particularly because we don't know how they do it. And in a sense, the goal of talking in, in um, environments like this is to present you some of the, um, the actions that our animals have. We don't want any mystic explanation. The, the, when the animal solves a problem, it must be using some kind of algorithm that it should be writable in some sense, and we should be able to code it. But uh, we are very far from capturing the capacity for novelty and broad domain decision making that we see these animals doing of the generation of um, new abilities. So, um, and I'm going to talk more or less about this topic today. Um, it's obvious that animals face different kinds of problems. Animals, and including plants, actually, I would say organisms, because some problems are very well defined. Um, you, you know, a frog has to catch flies, and um, a lamprey has to swim, and every generation may have similar problems to solve. We have to encode, for example, the, uh, use our retinas to detect movement and retinas in the brain to understand movement, and that's a very general thing. So natural selection have produced diff some mechanisms to solve these things, but also organisms face unpredictable problems where the parameters of the circumstances of the individual cannot be anticipated genetically, and then cognition provides a tool for solving that kind of problem. And I'm going to be focusing on this. The mechanisms are also inherited and evolved, but are a different kind of thing because they are more broad domain. And there are things like understanding causality or things like this. And then you can apply it to things that you didn't anticipate you were going to need. Uh, when I say you, natural selection could not anticipate that was going to need when it's coded in the, in the genome. And, um, I believe that some of the most interesting problems that one faces is how both real organisms and designed um, machines, autonomous robots and things like that, can be endowed and are endowed in the case of real organisms by dedicated processes and um, general relatively open domain processes and the interaction between those two things because it's, it's silly to defend any view, nobody does, that uh, organisms or robots can be successful and interesting using only one kind of thing. If you, if you only solve problems that you, you knew you were going to face, then it's a very boring kind of uh, instrument and a very stupid sort of behavior. But if you uh, don't have any kind of uh, anticipation of the sort of problems you have, you wouldn't even be able to learn a human language without some predisposition for the kind of problems that you could face. So um, I simply hope, I'm a, my interest my, my, is as a biologist, and I want to interact with engineers and robotics, uh, roboticists and artificial intelligence people to actually tell them if, if you had to program a robot to have this level of innovativeness and flexibility in behavior, how would you code it? What would you be doing? And um, for example, we all be in every talk has to show one of these uh, smartphones. So I'm showing it here because the reason these things evolve is that there is a market. And if there is a market, there will be a product. Um, so for example, these things have been extended, some games, I don't know if you've seen this one, but um, there are games for every interested party. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've seen this, but you could argue that the toad is behaving in a silly way because it's not getting any 
actual physical reinforcement. But of course, in nature, um, this kind of moving <laughs> 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 Most things that behave like the ants in that iPhone actually are ants, right? Or bugs of some kind. So the toad is actually acting optimally, taking into account that the, the, is what is called ecologically optimal. I mean, the, the probability of being misled by one of these instruments is relatively low in the ponds where, where they live. So what we have to understand is well, to what extent the toad is originally doing that and combining it, what it learns about these specific circumstances. Um, so a few issues before I really start talking about it. I first want to just mention a couple of examples of other people's work on the problem of whether intelligence is really always a good thing. and What kind of natural situations actually make intelligence be good? Uh, for you. I mean, what kind of conditions are, and um, also, if it's a good thing, why isn't everybody smart? I mean, I mean, why is the toad not learning to control its behavior, for example, or these kind of things? In the case of the parasitic birds that I described, it's quite extraordinary. Our hosts are very sophisticated in detecting when a uh, um, potential parasite ca approaches a nest to lay an egg, they have all sorts of tricks. Once the egg is laid there, they just look at it and it's completely different. They don't do anything about it. The same about feeding a chick, which could be twice or three times its own size and doesn't look at all like its own baby. And so why, you have to ask, is the animal apparently being so poorly designed? And the more we dig into that in the ecological environment of the animals, we see the trade-offs of uh, acquiring one ability at the, con uh, uh, the cost of another, and why the more you know about the parameters of what species lives, the more you find that an optimality approach actually is useful, not to say that animals are optimal for every circumstance, but that animals are very well designed, and I should say organisms, plants, for the distribution of probabilities of events that they may find in their natural situation, which is a very different concept. So when people say animals are not optimal, well, what do you mean? I mean, they really, of course, optimal behavior leads to failure because you take the, uh, the appropriate level of risk for whatever it has been in, in, in your evolutionary history. And of course, you don't anticipate the future. Natural selection only operates on past contingencies. So you have these kind of problems. And so these are issues that um, are normative from the point of view that we, we ask questions as to why are brains designed the way they are? Why is behavior the way it are? And it must be said that biologists are better at dealing with these kind of things than um, understanding the mechanisms of how the animals do it. While if you look, for example, at Eberhard's talk just before or, or other talks in this meeting, uh, working on neuroscience specifically, um, you have a lot of understanding of how certain things are done, but um, very often relatively less of what why is the system designed that way and not in some other way? I mean, what are the real biological circumstances that go to that? Let me just give one or two very quick examples. Um, for example, the, there's been a paper that I, I came across as a referee and I thought it was fun and, and uh, so I'm commenting on. Uh, this is a siskin. I um, don't remember this Spanish. Um, word for it. But anyway, this is a little bird that lives around here. This study was done in Barcelona. Yeah. And um, siskins have this yellow bar here in the wing. And they have all sorts of other things. But this yellow bar, which you can measure for their width, happens to be what attracts females. Females pick up males when they have a choice according to the width of the yellow bar in the male wing. And the question is, why would females do that? And what are the implications for this? Well, what these people did was to give siskins problems. Let me just show you very quickly. Let's 
Is it working? This is the system. It has to move these bars to the side, in order to, to a side or another, in order to be able to extract some food that is hidden underneath. It's not a very difficult task, but um, individuals differ in how fast they, they can do it. And so you could use the, the time to completion of the task. Um, Um, to as a measure of something in the ability of the animals. And here, you just can't, it's not focusing in great detail, but this is the time taken to the solution, and this is the, um, the width of the yellow wing patch. And what you find is that the bigger your yellow bar, then the shorter the time they take to decide, the, to sow it, to solve it. And here is another way of looking at the problem. Um, this is the um, animals divided through the median into the slow half of the population and the fast half of the population. And this is the length of the yellow stripe. And again, if you are very fast at solving it, you have um, a thick yellow bar. So the immediate question about this, this is it's fun. It's a, to me, it's fun. It's an interesting thing. But the problem is, uh, why? Does it work that way? In the sense of, um, yeah, size matters because, um, you know, females have this preference and that drives the, um, the evolution of the male and the preferences of the female. But why can't stupid siskins have big yellow bars? You know, in other species it happens that, um, you know, stupid individuals may have bigger parts. And, and one wonders what, <laughs> what is actually the... The, the constraint that is stopping that. And maybe you need to be very clever to find enough carotenoids because yellow dep depends on some pigments that animals cannot synthesize. And so they, um, just by, if you are good at problem solving in the lab, that means that in the wild, you are also good at finding um, the thing that, um, that um, would make you a good forager, and that could feed the babies better, or actually could lead to babies that inherit this good foraging capability. Um, but there are other species, for example, yellow hammers, that are yellow all over. So they, um, if they can do it, why can't siskins cheat in the sense of stupid siskins having a big yellow bar, and that would work? So we are interested in the problem of the evolution of signaling and, and cues that one partner in this interaction can use to actually deal with the selective pressures of interest in the other. And let me give you another example. This is in the Great Teat, Carbonero, and um, this is a work by Ella Cole in Oxford. And um, what she did for her thesis was a relatively simple task again. These Great Teats were captured in, for two days in the winter, taken to the laboratory, and um, allowed to face some problems. Uh, in this case, for example, it was a little platform and the animal had to uh, pull a bar to the side in order to get the food to uh, fall into the dish. And you could divide the animals and whether they are good at solving the problem or they are not good at the problem, you characterize them and then you let them go. And you just follow them in the field to see what is the reproductive performance next spring. You did this by Christmas time, and then you look at them again in June, when the spring has happened, and you see what, how did they perform. Did actually the guys who were cleverer in the lab, I'm using the words in a very loose way, it's a shortcut, um, actually did better in, in the world. Well, certain things are interesting. For example, if you have a number of solver parents capable of solving the task. That is, none of your parents could do it, one of them could do it and the other couldn't, or both your parents could do it. So in a sense, it's your, um, the alleles that you have here. Um, uh, you have a greater dose of problem solving here. And what you find is that the number of eggs that females which have that particular combination of parents lay is uh, significantly improved. So females who have 
two parents that were smart lay more eggs than those that um, had parents that were unable to solve the problem. Um, so there is a fitness advantage of being smart. And it could, of course, work the other way around. It could work that if you, for some reason, are, um, are very good at laying eggs, this promotes this ability. We don't know that, but um, it's interesting to look at costs. Because if you now separate again the non-solvers from the solvers and look at how they performed in the wild, what you find is that the number of chicks that left the nest uh, for the solvers was greater than for the non-solvers. But on the other hand, if you have many chicks, the probability that each one of them survives is decreased because they face more competition. And this is the probability that each one of them will actually make it to reproduce the next year. When you multiply these two things together, what you find is that the intelligent guys did not have higher fitness than the non-intelligent ones. So this is just to give some examples of what people do in, in the wild or semi-wild to try to understand uh, what drives the uh, evolution of uh, problem-solving capabilities. Um, okay. So we know that there have different sort of ideologies dominating this area. Um, people, uh, the early Chomsky particularly, were emphasizing the, um, the actually pre-established capabilities that we had for learning certain languages. And, and you would learn the parameters of the place you live in, but the task was pretty much well defined by the fact that you were a human, right? While people like um, that, uh, Skinner were emphasizing the organism as a kind of blankish kind of slate where everything that you learned was dependent on the reinforcements that you had without much previous structure to guide it. And of course, none of them was so stupid to believe that um, that was the only process, but that was the ideological emphasis. Uh, Skinner was quite biologically interested, and although he, for individuals, he worked on, on that way, he thought that what evolution did was fixing what a particular species finds reinforcing. And then uh, from that on, then the task was simply left to reinforcement learning. But of course, even from the 50s and 60s, there was uh, work in by developmental psychologists, particularly by Jean Piaget and followers, that um, could see the, the dynamic process by which, in order to perceive anything, you have to assimilate it to structures you already have. In order to learn, you have to accommodate to the input that you have. So you, you can only, you filter the world, but you get modified in the process of doing it. And the, it, he saw it as a continuous search for some kind of equilibrium between accommodation and assimilation where you adjust to the world. I think we, it's worth to keep these very broad sort of problems in mind when one tries to design autonomous robots because we want to know what's the level of specificity of the code that we want to put on them. And we have big problems um, on understanding um, how capabilities for learning fit into what animals actually do. And I want to show you one example related to birdsong. This is a bullfinch, also a European bird. The song of a bullfinch is It's extremely boring. Okay? This is all this animal does in the wild, and it's very repetitive. Any ornithologist would tell you when a bullfinch is singing. But if you carefully train a bullfinch, you get it to do this. Okay, but let me just show you a very interesting case of another bullfinch, also trained. You will see how it runs into difficulties.
can't remember how it goes on. <laughs> and it ends in success. But effectively, what he's doing is stammering, repeating the sequence that he had learned and in order to be able to start from some point and carry on. Now, so why... Sorry? How do they get trained to do this? This is commercially. Uh, actually, in the, I'm told, in the 19th century, um, and maybe 20th century or 21st century as well, many German aristocrats liked to have these uh, trained bullfinches, and people provided them for them. And then you told them which folk song you wanted or whatever. And so um, you can train them by actually, of course, exposing them at the critical period when they learn song which is when they are between um, five, uh, five weeks and eight weeks. It varies with the species. Um, so it's just exposure. And certain things facilitate learning. For example, if you show um, an adult um, model at the time that you are playing the song, then the animal is more likely to pick it up than if you don't. So there are other complications. But all I want to say is... Why the hell do they have this capability for learning all these sequences if what they do is that boring song that I showed you at the beginning? Yes, Just Giovanni. What happens if you put this, this bird in the wild? Would they, the other birds be attracted or be repelled by these songs? Or? They clap. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I, I develop yellow stripes. And then we'll yeah, be that's right. <laughs> Yes, the yellow stripes maybe sing better. I don't know. It's a different uh, problem. I was just trying to show you a few examples. Let me get a little bit more into the topic. I'm using a lot of time. Um, let me go back through some of the classical examples of problem solving. This is from uh, 1917, from the work of Wolfgang Keller. And this is um, some of his work described in a particular textbook of animal behavior. Basically, the chimp is placed with some bananas hanging from the roof and in a room full of boxes. And this is a description of what the animal does. And I edited it, so I just cut text and, uh, severely. It says, a chimp jumps fruitlessly at bananas that have been hung out of reach. And after unsuccessful jumping, becomes angry or frustrated, walks away in disgust, pauses, then looks at the food in a reflective way, then at the toys in the enclosure, then back at the food, then at the toys again, and finally begins to use the toys to get at the food. To all appearances, the chimps were solving the problem by cognitive trial and error. This is my emphasis. As if experimenting in their minds before manipulating the tools. The pattern of these behaviors, failure, pause, looking at the potential tools, and then the attempt, would seem to involve insight and planning, at least on the first occasion. Well, the question is, all this kind of over-the-top anthropomorphic description, what is really the justification for using it? Is it really that if we wanted robots to be built capable of innovating in this particular way, would we have to put in them insight and planning and that kind of thing? Or would some simpler protocol um, follow. So there are a number of different questions that actually um, um, speak to these sort of problems. But what I want to show is some uh, clever experiments done by a man called Robert Epstein, um, who what he did is um, train pigeons in the standard way you train a pigeon on separate sessions on different tasks. And he was kind of being a Skinnerian, he was kind of pulling a leg to the very cognitive interpretations in the slide before. And um, he said, well, suppose that a, a, a pigeon learns to peck at a banana, gets fooled by pecking it. And um, in this case, it's a little plastic banana hanging from the roof. It also learns to move a block of wood to a particular spot in the cage, and then it gets fooled. It only learns that jumping is bad. So if you jump, you don't get food. So they extinguish the pigeon's natural tendency spontaneously every so often to, to jump. And uh, they also train them that sometimes in different sessions, if you stand on the block, you, you get food. But one day, 
they place them in this situation. There is no spot in the ground. The bananas are too high so that the animal cannot um, reach them. And there is a block of wood somewhere else in the room. So what does the pigeon do? It's very similar to the problem faced by the chimps, you realize. And this is what the pigeon does. It looks agitated. It's, it's doing mental trial and error, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't jump because it's been trained not to jump. And now comes the interesting point. There is no spot there. So he's not paying attention to, to the block and, and that kind of thing. But when nothing else works, he tries standing on it, which used to be good sometimes in the past. And that didn't work. And then tries pecking at it. This is the first time this animal is in this situation. Now stand again. Game bad. And now he gets it. So the question that we have to ask is whether this pigeon is as clever as the chimps and was doing all mental um, elaboration that was attributed to the chimp or the chimp didn't need all that thing that was attributed to it and was doing it by a set of very simple reinforcement processes. In particular, everybody knows about extinction, reinforcement, resurgence, that's very important, the reappearance of all behavior when the circumstances are appropriate, even when the current behaviors are not um, reinforced, and automatic chaining, which is, if you wish, something which is a property of the environment more than of the animal. Basically, you can do one behavior and that can create the stimulus for the next one. And so the consequences of one behavior put you in a condition for doing that. So if um, you compare different species, it's perfectly sensible to use, to think that there would be other simple laws of reinforcement and the parameters will be changed between individuals um, because um, or between species because naturally uh, the problems that they face in nature are completely different. People argue that, uh, naively that the pigeons have been trained, but of course the chimpanzees were 30, 40 year old chimps in some cases, 25 year old chimps, which had a long experience from which they could generalize from the use of the different components. And so they were doing a synthesis which was creative, but it was not much more creative than what the pigeons did, which is very interesting. And uh, we want to understand to what extent something like a very general ability to frame problems and work with them and solve them is behind a lot of our, the behavior of our animals, or um, we simply have to find the parameters in reinforcement processes. And for that we have... Itself, Alex, these, yeah. these rules are not so different from Thorndike, for instance, right? If you, that, that would have been, again, a hundred years before. But that, that's time. the idea. No, no, the idea is that... Is, uh, is this is the law of effect, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is actually... This is the view I, I explained, that Epstein was the last active student of, of uh, B.F. Skinner. So um, what he was saying is what we've been saying all along needs refinement and quantitative tuning and everything else, but can account for virtually everything. Right? So um, there are still things that remain, like how you put them together sometimes, but that's why we need more conflicting and more controlled situations to claim that there are difficulties for reinforcement patterns like this kind. And I hope to show you some of those. Would you tell me when I'm sort of half an hour from when I should stop, <laughs> so that I become selective? Um, okay. Um, there's the issue of parsimony, which is important, always discussing. And uh, some philosophers of um, behavioral studies are now questioning what we've always taken for granted. And if you could uh, think of a simpler mechanism, like, say, uh, the law of effect that I described for pigeon with, with a little um, refinements, um, then you shouldn't invoke mentalistic interpretations or things like that, because they are simple. But the... I'm completely in favor of it in general, but we have to watch it because sometimes people confuse what is simpler for us 
to describe the problem and what is simpler for the system to implement. It could be that something that for us looks very complicated is actually relatively simple for brains to do it. And so parsimony has to be applied, but with caution and, and some, some level of wisdom. Um, so let me just um, I said all of this. Um, I, I have interesting questions to me. Are, uh, how much of our human problem solving is also driven by... I use reinforcement here as a short hand for all these laws of, of change, associative learning and things like that as well. And um, it, we know that it's very often the case that we perceive that we solve problems by reasoning is actually illusory. And I, um, I mentioned this in one undergraduate uh, course and then some of the students thought of a project and went around the Oxford campus asking different people why they thought that they didn't fall from their bicycles. So everybody rides a bicycle, and, and then people gave very logical narratives, so less than 1% appropriate to what really was going on. Very few people incorporate the rotation of the wheels, for example, in their explanation, which of course we know is not sufficient, but it's, it's a major component. And they, people just don't know why is it. And they do it, and then they think, for example, that they don't fall because they are moving forward, for example. Right, or because um, some force. So we impose on our own uh, behavior post hoc narratives that make us think that we are using rational problem solving. So let me go to some of the real research because it's, I'm using too much time to this. Um, one of our lines of work is on the New Caledonian crow. This is a particular species of crow. It lives in this lovely place in the Pacific, about uh, 2,000 kilometers from the coast of Australia, um, in New Caledonia. It doesn't look like it, but it's, until recently it was part of France, but it's uh, now uh, drifting apart. Um, this is uh, the island of New Caledonia, and uh, we have a few... Um, study sites, and um, the animal that we study has the peculiarity of using naturally tools to extract food. Here you see a New Caledonian crow in the wild using a stick to poke into a tree which has been um, eaten by the larvae of some beetles that um, make these burrows and they live inside these barrows. And what the crows do is they poke with the sticks and provoke the larvae, which have big mandibles. Each of the caterpillars is about the size of my thumb, until the caterpillar bites, and then they pull. And I try doing it. I have very amusing films, but I won't use the time for showing that, where I try to do it myself, and you really have to be as good as a good fisherman to know exactly the movement that you have to do so that the larva, if you pull too hard, the larva releases. If you, um, well, if you are too slow, it also um, won't work. So it's not provoking the, the larva. So these animals are really very skilled at doing that. And there's a very nice juicy prey that they get so with what's that. What's your success rate now with all your training? <laughs> Mine is very low. Lower than the, the crow? Oh, by far, really? yes, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I try myself on other tasks, like starlings looking for, for uh, leather jackets in grass and whatever, and then I'm a tenth of the ability of a, of a starling, okay. which is very important because, of course, they have, I'm better than them at some other tasks, it may not show, but, um, <laughs> okay. so, yeah, but, but they, <laughs> they are, yes, they are, they are dedicated, um, they have dedicated capabilities, but what, to what extent? So this is what we want to look. To what extent this is really dedicated? Just as a curiosity, because it's not part of this talk, we study them also in the field. Uh, this is an example um, of uh, one of the only, or the only example of technology used in our research. Um, what we do is we build some cameras. We, this is a camera strip from, um, from a telephone. A mobile phone, you can see the size here, and this is all the machinery, and this broadcasts a signal, a video signal of what this camera is seeing. And what you do is you put it in the bird in the tail so that the beam of the camera looks between the legs of the bird, and here is the camera in situ, 
so looking forward this way, and then you let the animal. Um, where is? I want to show you one of them. I think is here. I want to show you one of the films of um, that particular study. It's only as an example of the kind of data you can collect. The animal is free in the world and a broadcasting video to us. Um, this is... Um, you can see that you're looking between the legs. The animal is high in the trees. That's the sea, that's the Pacific. Yeah, the beach is there. And you can see the, the animals are color banded. And here you see the animal when it's making a tool. That's running on the floor. The quality of the comments is not very good. But. Then the animal has now um, a tool. Uh, where is it? You have to see it in a minute. Yeah, it's here it's working making a tool out of cutting twigs and things like this. And it now uses the tool to collect food somewhere. Here is a good view of the animal using this. They use it, by the way, for many other things, capturing other kinds of prey and things like this. And this, this kind of data collection is useful to detect that. Well, I won't stick to that too long, but you can see that you get a very rich um, perception of what the real world of the animals is simply by um, simply by using this this kind of technology in the wild. But what I'm going to talk about today is the animals in the laboratory. You bring them to the laboratory and you start asking, do they only know how to do what they really do with their tools, or do they have a relatively large capability for solving new problems? And our first shock actually came on this study of now over 10 years ago, when some of you may have seen this, um, this video that it turned viral at some point. Um, this is Betty, one of our crows, that was trying to get a basket full of food with a straight piece of wire. And it didn't work. And then, what she did is jamming the wire on the soft tape here, pulling from the side, and making a cute little hook with a pliable material that is not present in nature, and um, that solves the problem interestingly. But you saw that the animal put the wire in the, um, in the soft um, tape and pull from the distal place and have it in position to use it. The question is, would they also be able to solve the problem if the constraints of the task were different? Do they have in mind, as it were, the sort of tool that they want? So we gave them a task in which the raw material was a soft piece of aluminium, a flat strip of aluminium that could not be managed in that way. And this is the seventh trial in which the animal was exposed. Now it's operating on the proximate side, the business end, and it turns it around and then acts um, appropriately to, um, to get it. And um, this is interesting to see. A lot of our observations are accidental, so uh, I that was not, but I'll show you the next piece in this video was accidental. The animal couldn't get the food out of the basket here, and it takes the, the little basket to a platform in this cage, and tries there, and it can't do it. After a while, there was a cut, an edited cut, still can't get it, but then it seems to have a flash of memory and thinks that actually has a tool and goes to get it and now solves the problem 
with this particular tool. So when people study birds, for example, in the laboratory and tell you that they have a working memory of three seconds or four seconds, you have to start asking, if you give them a task they've been designed to do, would, would you really have the same level of performance or would you have some much better? So we thought this looks pretty general. They could turn it around, they understand that problem. But what if we gave them something where the necessary functional action was the opposite from the bending. Was that bending something that by chance they may have had in the world? So we gave them something bent and that by the fact of being bent was too short. And the question is, would they know how to unbend it? And this you can see in this. These are all supplementary material of published work. So, sorry for the quality, but you see that it's a bent thing and at some point you'll see a very specific movement, this one. It's never done that movement before. Did you see? Then you will see it in short, mo in, in slow motion. And it um, opened this just enough to actually reach for this morsel that is hidden there. Look at this. Oh, no. At the end of this, you will see them. The movement she's done to. Now, look at this. It's, you see, it's, it's not just chance. These animals seem to really have in mind the sort of solution that is being reached. Let me give you a few other examples. This is one that is interesting. This is, um, we gave um, these animals uh, a problem. And the problem was that there was, there five tubes. This tube contains food, roughly where the A is. Here, you should, can't see it here. And there's a very short stick in the front of it, which of course is too short to reach at the food. But these four tubes had also uh, little sticks. And these sticks, these three ones here, are of medium length. And you cannot reach them because they are deep into the tube, but you could reach them with a short stick. But once you get them, they are too short to get the food. But here, there is a long stick. And this stick is good enough to get that. But this is so deep that you can't get it with a short stick either. So the only solution for this problem is to pick up the short stick, get one of the medium ones, and then go and get the long one, and then with the long one come and solve the problem. And now this uh, solution, if you reach it without any failure, is what we call the vice chancellor solution. Because um, I presented this task to the vice chancellor of Oxford University, and to my surprise, he did manage to solve the task within a few minutes of trying. And so um, we were um, really, we didn't expect that, but. Um, and then he flew away. Yeah, yeah, he, he went very proud um, to do his vice chancelloring. Now, this is, I should say, are trial unique configurations. Every problem faced by the animal is different, so it's always a first time. It's, this animal is not conditioned, but he could see the problem from above. Now, look at what he does with a short stick in a minute. He just throws it away, gets this and turns it around to use the proper thing. And this animal, I repeat, is not training, trained, okay? So now he collects the long one, completely dismisses this, turns it around. And here we, there were two morsels. And the animal gets one, and the other one is left here. But he has dismissed the tool. But now he goes and gets it out, right? And doesn't get one of the others, he gets the, the real one. So the, Animal somehow is telling us that what he's doing is not strictly described by any very simple form of reinforcement because he's creating new solutions. And we don't know to what extent they are new. Nothing comes out of nothing. So um, it's, it's somehow using its experience and it's generalizing, but in a very complex way. There are other examples. I'm going to skip this because... Uh, um, 
Otherwise, I won't make it in time. Um, I, one thing I want to say is that they also use tools to investigate things, not only to extract food. Okay? But I want to show you one example that to me is interesting, tells me something um, that might be useful. And this is an accident. Uh, another bird was offered food in a very similar task to the very first one I described. There's food on the bottom of a surface of a chicken wire, the hole, you'll see it in a minute. And the animal is, in this case, is provided with a hook. And the animal is allowed to try and see um, if he can get it. And so this is the stick with a little hook there. And this is at twice the normal speed. And there's a basket of food there and a hole in this surface. Right? And the animal, not surprisingly, does it. He didn't have to make that hook, OK? We gave it to him. And after a little trial, again, the animal has not been conditioned at all to do this. It's just presented with a problem. Okay, this is when it gets interesting. The animal eats the food and now looks in its monocular style. You will see in a minute. And when it can't get any food in there, what does it do? It just puts the bucket back there. Right? Which you could argue, on one hand, is a stupid thing to do because it's not going to get refilled. But when you think of the problem from the point of view of the animal, the animal, what it's doing is reconfiguring the circumstances under which it did get food. So it's actually going back in the sequence of events to create what is, maybe you could think of it as a snapshot of the bucket in the bottom there. And, um, and it that keeps trying a few times. And it, it doesn't work. see the experimenter putting the food there? No, no. No, never. No, no. It's released into. That's right. The animal doesn't know how the food came to be what it is. Okay, and it keeps trying. I think this is interesting because I wonder whether principles of this kind could be elaborated a little bit and think of someone who solves a problem and then goes back in its memory and say, what did I see before I solved that problem? And kind of try to somehow reconfigure the history of the situation. And that could um, lead to potentially interesting problems of creativity. How many of your, of your crows would do this? That particular thing we only saw once. Okay. Right? And I should say this is another, the curse of this kind of research is that we have an extraordinary level of individual differences. Mm -hmm. We just can't reproduce everything because a lot of what in this particular line, uh, we can recreate the problem, but we can't recreate the solution. Because in many cases, the animals invent solutions that we didn't think of. For example, the first making of the hook was an entirely different experiment I'm not going to describe. It was about choice of tools. And but in, with the experiments you've shown us, do you have a feeling of, let's say, the boundaries of the solution space? So, Yes, I guess we do. I guess we do. Um, certain things, if nothing else, economic problems, things animals cannot do physically. Mm -hmm. Maybe the next uh, example will speak a little bit to this. Because okay. what I'm going to mention now is comparing problem solving between species and try to see what you can conclude from differences in performance. And this I want to do comparing the New Caledonian crow with another species, the kia, of which we have access to six uh, subjects. And we did it by using the following device. This is a multi-activity box. So it's a box which uh, all the sides can be taken out and replaced by different configurations, different sort of problems. There's a pedestal in the middle where there is a nut uh, or an appropriate morsel depending on the species. And the animals have to get at that. But there are four different tasks that they could do. They could either pull from a string or they could pick up a ball, a marble, and roll it down a chute that would dislodge the nut and make it fall out. Or they could open a little window. Here you see by transparency a little window. They can open it and they can reach 
like that, or they can insert a stick and push um, the nut that way, and, and then um, the nut would fall. And the idea here was that we offered the animals the four tasks. And I should say that kias are animals that don't naturally depend on tools in the wild, while New Caledonian crows do. And what we want to give is a battery of different problems, some, some of them using tools, others not, to identify what is their difference um, that allows them to do these different things. Now, um, once they master one of the techniques very clearly, we block that one. And we see how long do they take to discover the next one and master it. When they've done that, we block that one. And we let them carry on with the remaining two to see what they do. So every animal could do it in a different sequence. But we are testing how they can learn new solutions towards effectively the same problem. And I'll show you a quick movie which shows examples of the problem solving, not in the, ori in the order in which the animals did it. But this is the string task. This proved to be useless because it was too easy for all the animals and they did it almost uh, instantaneously, so uh, we didn't have variants to actually compare between species or between individuals. That's a key also. I forgot to say, these are New Zealand um, parrots. Now it's the board task. This is quite curious because this is an object, it's tool use in some sense, but it's, a, it's an object which has to be used at a distance. And they discovered this by themselves also, right? No training in any of the experiments that we to start today is training of the animal. This is, the Kias didn't have any problem with that. They just tried it. Now using the stick. Using the stick is someone, something that comes very natural to a crow. This is the crow doing it, so get it immediately. And perhaps the most interesting piece is this one now here. The Kia who doesn't use sticks in the wild is to use. And to me, in a very subjective description of this, I would guess that this animal knows what he wants to do and just has a very physical, ergonomic difficulties in actually achieving it. Because it, it's curved bill and now it manages to do it. Okay. And now we go to another one, which is the simplest task of all, you might think, well, except for string pulling, which is just opening a little window. And only one, only one of the crows learned to actually open the window. And even then, you will see something interesting when it does it. And now he could get the food, but he doesn't. What he does, he goes for a stick and makes it fall and gets it on the other side, right? And when you look at a Kia doing the same task, for the Kia, this poses no difficulty whatsoever. It just opens it up, all of them do it very quickly, and then they get the food. Now, so this is, yeah, this is the design. So let me show you a few of the results in a slightly more analytical way. Um, when we look at the number of sessions it took for um, the animals to discover a solution. This means solving it for the first time rather than mastering it without any difficulties. You can see here the kias, that's the number of tasks. It goes up theoretically up to four. And this is the average in the population of animals. And this is the New Caledonian crows. So the kias solve the problems, more problems, faster than the new, or actually discover them faster. Now, when you separate by kind of task, what you find is now the kias in red and the New Caledonian crows in blue, what you find, this is the number of trials to discover it, so lower is better. And the string was too good, as I said, uh, for all of them, they discovered it immediately. Opening the window took a um, long time for the only crow that did it, and relatively little time for the Kia. Dropping the ball to also very little time to the Kia and long time for the New Caledonian crow. Using the stick 
was easy for the crows and difficult to the Kia. So I'm trying to get here at intelligent solutions that differ markedly in what is easy and what is different between species and what are the parameters that they have. If we look at mastering techniques, I'm not going to go in detail, but again, the number of tasks mastered, this is having no problem with it, doing nine trials without errors, then the Kias again go faster, and the proportion of birds that master the task, so we had um, three of the tasks, we had all Kias solving them, and the stick only one of them did, and the New Caledonian crows again, here everybody did it. All the New Caledonian crows solved the stick, but fewer solved the other task. So the question is, these animals are different between species as well as being different between individuals. Now, what is the source of species differences? Is the Kia a clever animal than a crow? Well, the Kia are more neophilic. They tend to explore things more for ecological reasons, so problems of danger and predators and that kind of thing. The modality of exploration in the Kia is by touching things, making physical contact with objects, while the crows are mostly visual. They look at things at a distance. It's very difficult to discover how to solve some tasks in which you don't interact mechanically, while it might be easier for other tasks. Well, there is, this is an artifact which we recognize. Our animals have different histories, personal histories, but so I'm not going to discuss it because it's not interesting or was a problem. There is a question of ergonomy. That's the ability of the animals to actually do mechanically the task. And the kias which have no problems with pulling anything, but they can't hold the stick straight, while the crows actually are specially designed by evolution to hold it. So beyond what they can do cognitively, they have a better physical shape for certain kind of tasks. So we have these sort of differences. Motivation. One thing that is interesting is that the crows, whichever problem you give them, they try to grab a tool to use it. They have a motivation that seems to be relatively high order for mediating tasks with other objects, solving it with tasks. The Kia solve most things directly and only under laboratory conditions, as far as we know, would use an object to solve this problem. So um, there is something which you may or may not call cognitive differences. It doesn't matter too much, but it's just the motivation, the inclination for tackling the task in a particular format. And um, well, and the question remains, but after all of this, are there differences in their general intelligence, their capability to process new information, tackle many different problems? Uh, the answer is, we can't say. We need an almost infinite battery of problems in which we counterbalance all these different things to isolate what is this kind of G factor or whatever you want to call it, this general intelligence property that would allow them. Tasks that are easy for them are difficult for us and vice versa. Well, Alex, for the general intelligence, this is a nice paper by Adrian Owen recently where he shows that there's, if you try to map this G factor to the brain, it actually decomposes in a number of processes like I say, rule learning, working memory, and so on. So yeah. maybe if you split it out in those terms, you might be able to find a difference. Like, is there a working yes. memory difference between these two types of birds? Do you Who know? knows? We okay. don't know. Okay. And the, one of the problems is that to measure working memories, we tend to use stereotypic, um, stereotypic for the researchers, uh, methodologies like delay matching to sample, that kind of thing. And uh, is performance affected by motivation? Is there a level playing field? Mm -hmm. So some animals may not have a, a constraint in working memory, but just don't want to engage in the task sure. to the same extent. Yeah. The, both the crows and the kias get bored when you present them a task repeatedly. And that's one of the constraints we have. And, and so mm -hmm. it's just, they engage in the task differently. Mm -hmm. So the more you are dealing with a complex organism, the more you have. I wanted to get a slide that I didn't get in time for today, for the beginning of my talk, which related to Sten's rationale for using lamprey as a um, research animal. And he had four or five bullet points of reasons why you 
could, whether it's good to study lamprey. And I thought each of those are um, exactly the opposite of studying these kind of animals. I would say, well, reasons for studying these kind of animals. We don't really know what they are trying to do. We don't know their brains. We can't control conditions. We don't have the circuitry of the animal. So almost everything is exactly the opposite of what would make a good model. So all I'm trying to say is that there are um, research programs and research programs. And, and then what makes a good animal for a particular kind of, of uh, research um, is very different from what makes an excellent topic, an excellent model when you want to study something else. And the question is to be aware that if you wanted to study details of how the neural control of these behaviors operate, this, I wouldn't recommend to use these animals, not at all. One of the reasons is that these animals are very long-lived, they can live 30, 40 years, and, um, and then uh, they become contaminated by experience, like people having on behavioral experiments on chimps, they have this big problem that animals become kind of institutionalized. They, they, you train them and train them and train them and train them, and then in the end, you lose track as what the animal could be generalizing from all the different tasks that you've been training. And we have the same problem with these animals. You just can't actually um, pick up a parrot, test it in, uh, like a mouse in one task, and then um, chop their heads and look at uh, whether there was some early gene expression or whatever you have in, when you solve that task. I mean, this is just not feasible, either legally or even ethically, I would say. Um, so... Uh, it depends what you want to know. Now, let me um, move species a little bit. Um, I want to move to these guys now. These are goffin cockatoos. And um, these guys, the New Caledonian crows, use tools as I describe in nature, and we study some details of their tool making. These guys have never been described to use tools in nature. Okay, they live in Indonesia, in the Tanibal Islands. And um, as an accident, one of these animals was playing with a stone, and the stone fell out of its cage. And we didn't film that. But what, then we put a nut. But this is what the animal did when the stone fell out of its cage. It cut a splinter from the beam and used it in an extremely controlled way to grab whatever was placed there. Right? And from the time it did it for the first time, then uh, it had no difficulty in doing that. In one occasion, for example, it cut something which was too long. You'll see it in a minute. conscious of the seconds run, but um, this is what... The animal, by the way, is not alone, but is the only one to find this solution to the problem. I talked about individual differences. Um, so, now it tries, and this is a horrible tool. It's too long. And so what it does... It gives its back to the to its target in a second and cuts it, makes it shorter. And now it comes and um, and the tool works appropriately. So once again, the animal is probably generalizing from something, but it's silly to say, because it offers no explanation to actually um, 
simply say that it must be something in its history that helps it doing it. We don't know what is it and what level. So it's very difficult to avoid um, using functional um, teleological interpretations for the animal trying to achieve something. Particularly, it's very detailed actions that it does at every step, not all directed at actually getting the food. It's mediated by actually building the tool. And the interesting thing is that if you look, this is the number of trials. This is not sessions, trials. And this is the time it took to make the tool. And the first trial, it took a long time, like 25 minutes. But from then on, he knew what he wanted. And this is the time it took the use of the tool. It was virtually flat, well, hitting a, a floor here when it's in, in this scale, you don't see much improvement. There is a, a small improvement. So, but the basic thing is they take some time to figure out what the problem is. And after that, it's not an incremental process of repeating and by reinforcement what they are doing. They are actually just as good in the second trial as they are ever going to be because they know what the task is. If you look at the different tools, this one is an interesting one where the animal actually picked up a branch. If you forget the broken lines first, this was a twig which had this, ram, this little twig is to the side. And the animal um, started to work with this, but cut this, and it wasn't good then, cut one. Then cut that, and was left with this, and it was too long. Then cut three, and it was again too long. And then cut four, and this is the one that the animal used. So they really are configuring the tool that they are going to need for the task, sometimes without uh, taking the thing to, to exercise. And now I have the final example I want to give. I'm still all right for one more example. These are the same goffin cockatoos. This work, by the way, is mostly done by Alice Auersberg, who keeps them in Austria. Um, these animals were given a task in which there was a nut it's here you see it better, it was a nut behind a transparent window, which had uh, uh, some food reward there, but they, this couldn't be opened because there was a latch there blocking it. So this latch had to be moved to the right to be able to open this and reach the nut. But the latch could not be moved because there was this wheel in place. And so they had to remove this wheel in order to be able to move the latch. But the wheel could not be removed because there was this pin there and the wheel had to be rotated to align the slot with the pin so that it could be removed and then the latch could be moved. But the wheel could not be moved because there was a little notch on the edge and this cylinder, steel cylinder, was, had a nose that was fitting on that so that this wouldn't rotate. And so this had to be pulled up in order to be able to move the wheel, etc., etc., But this could not be removed because there was a screw here, a bolt, that had to be removed by unscrewing it in order to move this and go on. But this could not be rotated because there was a pin here passing through a little hole. So the solution to this required pulling the pin, unscrewing this, pulling this up, turning this around, moving it out here, and then shifting this and getting this. The animals get trained only to the fact that moving the latch is okay, is necessary to get the food. They train, they are exposed to it, and they immediately do it. But these animals have been reinforced for that. And then they are placed to this situation all at once. And the interesting thing is that, of course, they've got to do things for which they have never been reinforced and which are completely unnatural sort of actions. So what do they do? One of our experimental animals solved the problem in about an hour and a few minutes without absolutely any support. Others didn't, but could do it after seeing someone else doing it or some other forms of support. Here you see, I have to start it. a couple of examples of the animals doing it. This is the basic task. A 
now it starts turning the screw. The important thing is that this is a means means end task. I mean, this is the animals solving things that um, are required in order to be reinforced for each of these things. They don't get reinforced for the whole sequence until they do it. So a purely naively law of effect type of explanation that the animal tries everything just is impractical. This is another animal, and that's interesting because it finds an entirely different way of doing the screw. This one does it with its foot instead of with its beak. Um, this is another issue. We have every animal does the specific motor um, um, involvement is different for every individual, but they achieve what they want to do. So I. Because of time, I'm not going to let you see much more of this, but basically um, they do it. So once they do this kind of thing, we move to some proper experimentation. And we ask the question, OK, they've achieved it. Either the one animal who did it completely spontaneously or the others that had some scaffolding, as it's called, for solving it. But what have they learned? For example, if we scrambled the order of the logs, would they go for the lock for, for the device that was the first time that had to be acted with originally, or will they respond logically to what's going on in the new configuration? If we removed a device in the middle of the chain, would they go to the beginning and reach the empty gap, or would they go to the one immediately um, distal to the gap, or proximal, I guess you would say, to the target, the, the, one, the first one that you can actually move and go to that. So we can do transfer tests of this kind. And these are the sort of tasks that we do. For example, in this transfer test, what we do, this is the um, original situation that you saw before. And here we remove the pin. And, um, forget what is interesting about this particular condition. Um, here we remove the, the screw, and so the animal can do this, rather than pulling this. Um, here we remove that metal thing, this, this one, so that it can rotate that directly, if it wants. And here we remove the wheel, so that it can go directly there, rather than going to the beginning of the trial. This is another transfer test, in which what we do is um, an altered configuration. So this is a test, comparing with that, which was the original condition, for whether they would go for this, which was the first originally, or they would now go for this, which is what they needed uh, to do it. And then, again, we remove parts in the new configuration, with which they have no experience. And we have other kinds of transfer tests. And I'm not going to show you movies of this, for the sake of time, but I'm going to just briefly show you a description of the results. When you see a star, is when the animal significantly did well, did better than random in one of these transfer tasks. And you see basically quite a lot of stars. Without going into details, the overall picture of these transfer tests is that when you modify the task in a reasonable way, they seem to figure out by looking at the problem and this is a very conservative test because this is based on what is it that the animal touched first. And of course, if they do something, they touch first something that is wrong, they would be assigned here as not having figured it out. But in fact, it would be a reasonable exploration strategy to touch something and if it doesn't work, you go to, to the other one. So it wasn't critical that they did it. Failing this doesn't make you an idiot. but um, but. In many cases, the majority, they actually did it right. And to me, even more interesting is that if you exclude the one plus, what you see in this little table, these are different subjects, and these are the different devices, and this is the number of errors that they committed in trials subsequent to the first trial in which they solved it. And you see a lot of zeros. 
And what this means is that the animals may have taken some time to discover what to do, for example, with a, with a board. See, that's quite important. If you look at this one, uh, sorry, the screw, which is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. And you see these animals, after they solved it once, one, two, three, four, so four out of them didn't commit any more errors. And the one plus is one or two errors, right? That is failures to solve a problem that you have solved once. So just as we saw when the um, time course of building a tool and solving the problem in the previous experiment, these animals, once they solve something, they don't fail again, right? This is the time that it takes, um, yeah, is 100% is the first the time it took the first time and for the different uh, devices and what you see is this is the mean I think no the mean is the dotted line here that there was a slow improvement here but basically it's the first time that takes uh, a long time so they I think the best way to describe what they do is that they operate like a ratchet in which at the beginning, they don't know what to do. They figure it out in ways that I, I'm far from understanding. But it involves an element of rattling everything and touching things and exploring. But once something works, even if you are not reinforced with the food, you find it reinforcement, reinforcing because there is a goal-directed notion that you are closer to the solution simply by removing one of these things. So the, the Skinadian approach, if you want, the law of effect thing might work, but it works in a very derived form. Once you know where you're going to, you want to get, then components of the task act as reinforces in themselves. Um, once they solve one of these, they obviously conceptualize it in a way that allows them to solve it. From either. So um, I'm going to sort of finish with a few kind of um, scattered thoughts and uh, no, no solutions, but um, tool making in New Caledonian crows, I should say tool making and tool use, is a typical species trait. They do it in the wild. Most animals in the species do it. And if you raise animals like a Caspar Hauser animal, you raise it in the laboratory without ever observing anybody else human, keeper, or animal using tools, these New Caledonian crows use tools. And they do it clumsily first. I could show you movies. They are, they are very, um, um, they do a lot of mistakes, and they get better. And we don't know whether they get better by development or they get it by experience refinement. But, um, but they discover it. Uh, they have the motivation to use tools. But once they have that, they are extremely flexible. So to use the word innate would be completely unjustified for tool use, other than in a very superficial sense of the motivation to do it is something that doesn't require any input. But after that, um, they, they are programmed to do this, but then they get better and they solve all sorts of new problems with that. In comparison, tool making in Goffin's cockatoos, the last example we saw, is um, not something that we see in the wild. So it's very probably an individual innovation. It's something that um, seems to somehow well on the animal's capability for broad domain problems. You know, I, I always remember an interesting uh, reflection in one of Chomsky's earliest work when he um, compared the complexity of playing chess and human language. And said, so, well, playing chess is extremely simple. It's a very easy task when you compare it with being able to speak in an articulate way. I don't need to say this to people working on artificial intelligence, but if you imagine the ability to compose sequences, parse them up, understand, acquire them with the parsity, the, 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 the poverty of the stimuli that you get, compared with learning a few rules of chess, is uh, incredible. But we use chess as a measure of human intelligence and not the ability to speak or or learn Mandarin or, or Catalan or anything like that. So why is it that we do that? Well, we do it because we're particularly bad at it. It's that we choose as a game 
um, things for which we are not shaped by natural selection and it taps into that difficulty and then there is great individual variation and that's what makes it useful. While there is very little individual variation in something that genetically all of us need and deploy. So it's this kind of play that we have to pay attention to when we are working with this species. Very often biologists focus on what they can't study and one thing is individual differences. That's very fashionable nowadays. The study of what they call animal personality which I think is a destructor, rather than looking for species patterns, however abstract is the pattern that you can deduce, they are focusing more on, on the individual differences. But it, it, it could work together, both things can work together. And um, we don't know whether the cognitive aspects of when a new Caledonian crow and a goffin, for example, solve a tool problem, tap onto similar resources or not. Do they do it the same way when they do it? And what kind of experience they need? Um, both are very social species, and we know that social input affects the way they do things, but we also know that social input is not um, essential for doing it. They, they can find these solutions by themselves. Um, but in the case of the goffins, we, only one individual has been seen inventing how to make a tool to reach that. And we are using that individual now as a model to actually display to others. And we control the situation. For example, we are doing it in ways where um, the, uh, the, the model is there, but uh, the food moves to it by a control magnet underneath without the animal doing anything active with the tool. We have other situations where the animal is not there, but the tool is moving by again controlled by magnets from under the table to um, displace the nut. And we're trying to parcel out what aspect of what they observe makes it possible for them to acquire and discover these things. So uh, this is the sort of thing we do. And I believe that I don't have much more to say. Um, I'm very hopeful of interacting with, with people of current and, and forthcoming generations of um, people working on robotics and artificial intelligence. I'm honestly interested as I am on anything biological, and particularly how the brain works. I hope that more help at this level will come, not from understanding how real brains do it, but actually from understanding what you need to code into a robot to make it perform similarly to this. Once you do it, that doesn't prove that the animal does it in the same way, but we may be able to um, discover minimal systems to allow for creative problem solving of this nature at a very algorithmic level before um, we really can get into the neural basis of some of these problems. And, um, well, the question I raised in the title, whether we could actually use the algorithms that um, people in AI need to develop to make robots solve problems autonomously. And um, we could, as biologists, get inspiration from that. And I think we can only do it if we work on mixed uh, themes, mixed teams and, and, and networks and all that. So just to finish one slide, um, remember I don't want to make too much about um, brain size, but I just one kind of um, thing to um, debunk some uh, illusion that uh, some people have. Um, brain size does matter to some extent. Uh, they have all findings to this. But um, basically, we all know that if you are, uh, this is a logarithmic scale of body weight, and this is uh, brain size. And basically, the bigger you are, the bigger your brain. But of course, <clears throat> the absolute level of brain size is not what is crucial, but really whether you have a specialization of something that really requires big brains. And we know, for example, that humans are in this point, which is like almost 10 times smaller brain than the, the elephant and the, and the whales, the blue whales, but um, because this is logarithmic, remember. So they are much dominant, but they have, they are in this peak of this kind of polygon, and this is uh, the, the greatest deviation 
from the, the greatest residual with respect to the mammalian um, general allometric regression. Um, but if you look at birds now, birds have more or less the same uh, brain as mammals for a given body mass. And again, if you look at this peculiar point here, what you find is that crows and parrots, in general as a family, tend to be in this point, which is rather similar to that. Okay, so I leave you with this thought and um, finish here. Gracias por la atención. Great, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? So this is absolutely yeah. fascinating, and I want to ask about the fact you said that uh, the birds see someone else perform the task, they can do it quicker. And I'm wondering whether there's any evidence that makes a difference whether the demonstrator is a bird or a human. I mean, this goes to this issue of agency and how much the brain can actually, uh, well, Yes, uh, well, that's what I told you, that we are doing these controls, and this is, uh, in this particular case, this is unfinished, and we don't know. We know that for certain things, I mentioned at the beginning that, for example, for acquiring bird song, you can play song to, um, to an animal, and it would learn it to some extent, but if, while you are playing it, you're also showing a male, this is mostly male song, of the same species, then the acquisition is much stronger. So it's a facilitator, and if you want an occasion setter for the animal that allows that. With um, tool use, the difficulty is that the salience of seeing a cone specific is large in itself. So if you were to compare seeing a human with seeing another parrot, you would have to check whether the animal is imprinted on a human, has been hand reared or not, because if it is, it might be that seeing whoever was psychologically the animal is attached to is what is important and not the fact that it's a conspecific. We, some of those things we, we have done. We, um, we did, yes, we, we have one, one paper in Nature published where these animals were reared in captivity. We had only four animals, four chicks born in the lab and we divided them in, in two pairs, right? And one pair had absolutely no exposure, and the other had exposure to a human using a tool um, with, craftily. When these animals see a significant other, which could be the human or another crow that has reared it, doing this, they come and watch. And it's impossible not to describe it as, you know, they are paying attention like that, and they actually grab, when the mother crow or father crow is doing it, they grab the stick and they move with them. And then when the parents drop the stick, they pick it up and they play with it, right? And then they, they use it, and they use it in a very clumsy way until they get better themselves. And what we found is that the start of using tools was not differentially um, timed in the Caspar Hausers and the, the, the ones with demonstration and the ones without, but the ones which were followed later with demonstrations acquire greater skill, greater performance, and develop better uh, later on. It's a little bit like a human, um, I think in the, in the Lamprey talk we were hearing that they, um, when a human learns to walk, then uh, social inputs are crucial to how you end up walking. You can detect someone from a different culture from the back at a distance so, um, because they, they walk in a different way. But, so we are influenced by culture, we are modulated by culture, but we apparently don't, don't need that as the kernel for us doing it. And we know that in different parts of the wild, this is worked by our independent, it's an independent group led by Gavin Hunt and Russell Gray in New Zealand. They found that in different parts of the island, they build tools which are slightly different in shape. And in the first, this I think is extremely important. And so that led to our study because more or less the conclusion they reached was that this was culturally 
culturally transmitted. But it turns out that if you rear the animals in isolation and you expose them to the raw materials, they do it. They do it in a clumsy way, but they do it too. But that doesn't mean that there is no cultural influence. It's simply that it's not essential for getting you movement. Doctor. Yeah. One way to account for these creative uh, problem-solving abilities that you see is that in some sense that the behavior is mediated by models, so that these animals construct some sort of model, okay, that yeah. is slightly more involved than just behavior being slave of the stimulus. And then in some sense the algorithms, okay, that they use is the algorithm for solving these, these models, okay. So I tend to think, of course, that people may be quite reluctant to this notion that even animals build these models okay, to guide their behavior, but it uh, uh, looks like this is... Oh, I, I, I have absolutely no uh, difficulty with non-humans uh, having uh, proto-elements of what we perceive as that. But what I have difficulties with is with automatically assuming that that is really the way we do it, and also when we extend it to other species without the possibility of a verbal report, it's even more difficult to test this kind of idea. So that's why I say, if, I, if you show me that you can build a robot with a roughly similar level of creativity, then um, would I need to postulate that it has to have some kind of modeling um, computation to, in order to reach it or, or not? Uh, let me uh, tell you one example that Michael Brady um, uh, raised to me from his, uh, the time he was in MIT in his lab. Um, this is a robot that was trained to visually interpret the task that it was put in front of it and would go to a panel with tools and pick up the right tool for that task and come back and do it. And one day the animal is giving a nail and a piece of wood, not the robot, sorry. It's giving a nail and a piece of wood. And it looks at it, goes back to the panel, and it was a fortunate accident, an anecdote, that they had forgotten, someone had forgotten the technician, to put the hammer in the panel that day. Now, the robot starts looking at it, gets very upset, and starts um, tinkering around and moving, just like Keller's chimps and kind of saying, you know, what, what do I do? And it gets this, uh, all, all the projection that you may want to put on it, and eventually grabs a screwdriver. And they say, okay, he's doing it wrong, right? But the robot goes back, gets a screwdriver by the blade, and uses the handle that he has never used before as the business end of the hammer to put the nail in. The beauty of this to me is that it's very creative, it's new, but because it's a robot, we can ask, what did the robot really do? And the answer is not difficult. It comes as follows, because of course you, you have the computations, you can track it, what the animal, what the, the instrument did. The visual system used, implemented to identify things was based on a kind of cubistic construction in geometric shapes, a bit like a Picasso thing. So everything is decomposed into triangles, spheres, and, and circles, and whatever. So that's a hammer in the mind of the robot. It's something with two rectangles with their axes perpendicular to each other, and one longer than the other. That's the ideal hammer. And I think it had been trained by reinforcement on these kind of things. And of course, the day this is not there, it starts relaxing a little bit and generalizing and finds that if you have two rectangles which are aligned as opposed to being perpendicular, that is a hammerish type of thing, right? And so, but you still would grab it by the narrow thing because you're using, and then you go and use it. So in the end, behaviorally is very impressive. It's also the kind of thing that if you see it in an animal, you immediately jump to the conclusion, or in a human, you jump to the conclusion that this being reasoning, even if the human tells you that this reasoning about it, you don't know whether it has actually, what, what really led it. But in practice, it has an algorithmic solution that is implementable, and that doesn't make it less attractive to me. Is it? But what I'm after is as much as possible um, examples of, in animals, saying what could be doing is this, and then do the critical test that say, okay, 
how would this algorithm respond to a transformation of the task that, for example, alters the number, the order of actions, or, or the, the visual uh, configuration, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem is you, you, you can't be good at everything, and this, uh, you, you have to work in, in interdisciplinary teams, there is only way, and not, I would say not interdisciplinary, but multidisciplinary, because interdisciplinarity is an excuse for shoddy work sometimes. So you are doing neither one thing well nor the other. What you want is people who are committed and good at one particular discipline, working with someone who is committed and good at others, and then put the best of the two to work together, and with specific skills and abilities, and this is what I hope this kind of summer schools might get. That would be hope so. Uh, mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, I'm referring to the uh, video you show about the crown and the key open the window. And it was presented as if in that, uh, in that constant, in that context, uh, the key performed better. Uh, but it could be that the crown was solving two problems at a time. The second problem is that probably the crow had some uh, more cautious behavior and didn't want to stick the head inside the window. So one interesting thing is how can we transfer this to AI, for example, and solve two problems at a time? Because then uh, solving one problem nowadays, I would say it's relatively easy, you know, even in total, you know, uh, in the well-known robotics. So I know, I, you I, did you I, make yes. an experiment on that, on two, um, two problems at the same time or not? Well, First, at, at the observation, the, the, the answer to the final uh, thing is no, <laughs> not yet. But uh, just a comment on this thing. There was this kind of artifact that I, um, I, I showed, but I didn't uh, stay on. And the fact that the Kias that we used were all reared in captivity. The crows that they used were captured from the wild. So they were more timid, shyer, kind of individuals simply on the grounds of their personal or their individual history. But even without that distorting factor, the crows in general are much less neophilic. They are, they are uh, uh, cautious and they, um, they tend to look at things from a distance. And the window task is something that you can't actually solve from a distance because you don't understand what a hinge is. So um, the, the Kia has the advantage of actually trying everything. And they, they are famous for destroying people's uh, windscreen wipers, for example. When you go to a, to a park and, and, and leave your car, they, um, they, they come and, and pull rubber things out and they destroy anything they can because they basically are very uh, tactile, haptic, exploratory animals. And so um, the crows are not like that. And they are more cautious. And they even use um, uh, tools, as I described before. There's some of the movies I didn't show is you put a, um, a rubber snake and the, in, the, in the aviary, and the animals come and pick a relatively long stick and start poking at it and, and, and jumping back. Um, only when um, they've done this for a few times, they drop the stick and they look around and they approach on the tail of the snake, the opposite side of where the eyes are, presumably, and just give it a pinch and then go back. After all, it's possible food, but you have to know how it behaves. And also, it's, a, it's play. One uh, probably underestimated process, sorry, this is not your question, but it's something that is coming more and more to us. Um, an under-attended issue is play. We think that uh, our animals learn affordances of the surrounding environment extensively through play that extends into adulthood in some cases, but is particularly intense in juveniles. Non functional in inverted commas activities, uh, that is not immediately functional things, in which they manipulate objects and they touch things and they move and they are basically acquiring like a library of wisdom that can be pulled on when necessary at a later time. So we don't know what the deprivation of those opportunities do to the ability to innovate. This is, um, I think, an ideal 
road for tackling this kind of problems it would be more developmental studies. But, um, you know, Drosophila or mice are good animals for Daphnia, whatever, for uh, developmental studies, but um, a generation of crows is almost as long as a, uh, certainly as a scientist lifespan as a scientist. So it's very difficult to, um, to do developmental work on these animals. Also, you can't catch them. But Alex, would you say that if you would be able to lift this ergonomic constraint, that in principle all, all bird brains would be able to, to, to use tools, and to build tools? No, I wouldn't make that, uh, that okay, statement. Okay, what's the difference? Uh, that I don't know. But, um, for example, another species, the, the other mm -hmm. uh, major example of a bird species that uses tools, is the Galapagos woodpecker, woodpecker finch. Mm -hmm. um, this is a bird, a small bird. Um, it's a passerine. It's an, it fits into that thing. It has a normal brain size. But um, it very clearly is the ecological opportunity that has driven these animals to do it. And it's not, to our knowledge, reflected in a much greater general intelligence in any way. Mm -hmm. For example, the work of um, Sabina, Sabina Tebic in Vienna, well, she works in the Galapagos, in the University of Vienna, has shown that comparing in a, a bunch of problem-solving tasks, um, woodpecker finches of two related very close species, one that uses tools and one that doesn't, doesn't give you any particular great difference in performance um, in, in other tasks. Mm -hmm. So I have maintained for a while that my, my view is that tool use is interesting because it's particularly revealing, or potentially revealing with the right experiment, of what's going on in the mind of the animal, but not because it's particularly demanding. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that it's incredibly difficult. It's simply that um, it shows you it's easy, easier to study than other kind right, of perfect. tasks. And, and how, why other species cannot do it, that's a, that's a curious thing. Why, mm. why is tool use so rare? And one view on this is that, um, that it's not often useful. That well, the animals... Economics. As you showed also with, with these, um, uh, these parrots, yeah. They have great difficulties with these sticks because it's yes. just difficult. That's right. They They've evolved for other things. So, so yeah. I'm saying if you, if you would lift this ergonomic constraint, maybe let's say we, we wire up these bird brains with, with apps and devices so they can control all sorts of robots yeah. with just uh, brain activity, then. I think the key is wood, but I think um, other species not. For example, our parasitic birds, they do some tasks which at cognitive level are quite remarkable but an entirely different nature. So the female needs to know which nests in her home range are available for egg laying. And this requires to identify a suitable host species which has just built a nest and is in the middle of the laying week. You know, birds lay one egg per day during the laying week, typically. Never more, but sometimes they have gaps. And so you have to identify a nest, which is in the right thing, because if the female, if the owner of the nest has started incubating, that nest is no good for you anymore, because your egg is going to be delayed with respect to the local ones. And if there are no host eggs there, it's also no good for you, because the host will immediately remove something. And so they should. So they have to do this. And how do they do it? They scout their home range during the daytime, and um, when they, uh, we don't know much more than this, that they scout around, but then they go to sleep, and on the morning, before sunrise, in the dark, they actually zoom to one particular nest, which is one in good condition, and obviously, remember from yesterday, and that's where they attack where they uh, parasitize, that's where they lay the egg. So we know... All the other birds are in that nest. Uh, in some cases, yes, and in other cases, not. It's a, that's a complex story in itself, i hmm. tell you more. But what I'm raising at is that they have this kind of spatial temporal bookkeeping mm -hmm. 
of the available things. And they have to remember when they lay an egg and never go back to it anymore. Because once they lay it, they, it, it will be damaging for their own success. Now, when we test spatial memory tasks in birds in the laboratory, we have such a, a paltry demonstration of what they can do compared with this kind of a kaleidoscopic thing of the world changing day to day and the animals remembering it. And, and they don't have long. They don't have many trials. They just look at it and, and then um, come back again. So it's quasi-episodic in a sense. Mm -hmm. right, exactly. These animals, we know, for example, that the hippocampus mm -hmm. um, of the females is bigger than that of the males and that this difference is only present in the parasitic ones that have this habit. Right. So there is a very clear dedicated capability to this particular kind of task. Right. So it's a question of homing into with the animals. Let me give another example of a dedicated memory feed. In Danox, work by Nick Davis in Cambridge, the, when the chicks are there, you can see a female and one or more males feeding the babies. But if you go three weeks earlier, when the eggs were fertilized, what you find is that it's a very complex story, but if a male in the neighborhood manages to copulate once with that female, then it doesn't show up anymore. But three weeks later, when her babies are born, he comes and helps feeding. But if he hasn't, he wouldn't help at all. Right? And this is compared between different groups. So they are very specialized, but if you test them on that, they will show you great mm -hmm. performance in memory. One trial, quasi-episodic right. uh, switching of the behavior. You, know? you label that nest is one in which to help because they have at least one small chance that those are going to be my, right. my chicks. So it's um, I think Giovanni okay. had a question. Okay. I don't know if... Okay. So look, one last question, and then, the, so who has the most important question of you three? I say that Giovanni has been asking for long, sorry. Yeah, I, no, I, no. I don't know if it's more important, no, but... Uh, I have no idea. Well, you want to do it. There is, there is, well, thank you for... for yeah, really, this video is really... Immediately, uh, you interpret this video in some uh, human-like way. And I wonder if there is uh, some some easy way to this ambiguity situations. And so I wonder if there is a way to measure surprise in these animals. Because in a sense, if you are really stimulus bound, uh, that makes a difference. If you are well, if you are using a model for which you also predict the consequences of your action, and in that case you, you should anticipate what will happen next. Or if you are only stimulus bound, you are not really predicting what will happen next. You just recreate the behavior problem. Mm -hmm. So if there is some easy way to measure surprise, maybe uh, if, if something yes. unexpected given the internal model happens, then the animal should be surprised in one case, but not if it is only uh, following yeah. a stereotype of behavior pattern. Yes, so, I, I agree with you. I mean, you could do things, some experiments that speak to this problem is train the animal to use tools in physically non-intuitive, in logical ways. For example, using, say, magnets or something like that, so that something that doesn't exist and the animal, a, a little bit of the counterintuitive tasks that you, that you use in which, uh, you know, if you mo want to move to the right, then move to the left. Um, and that kind of things would use surprise to reveal what, um, like it's done in, in, in pre-verbal, uh, human babies, that you, you look at their numerical abilities, but whether they sort of gaze longer when something arithmetically awkward has happened, like, you know, two plus two gives five, and then they, they stop a little bit, and so this kind of thing. So they, people do similar kind of things. I mean, we, we haven't done it directly that way. But every single one of our experiments exposes the animals to a, a novel situation. So... It is surprising in one sense, but we are, no, we are not using surprise as a dependent variable, which is what you suggest, and I agree is interesting. All right, with that, we thank Alex again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.